When evil squatters take over a couple's home without their knowledge, they are devastated. The wheels of the law move slowly, and they are forced to relocate while strangers destroy their house. Then, a biker gang appears and does the absolute unimaginable. Miles and Tracy Albert thought they had sealed the deal of a lifetime when they bought a four-bedroom house in Riverside, California at the beginning of 2020. The anticipation of finally having the perfect place to call home made their hearts sore as they approached what they would soon learn to call their street. But as their car turned the corner, their smiles faded. They both saw something that made their stomachs churn. The once well-manicured lawn was now overgrown with weeds. The flowers they had fallen in love with during the first stages of the sale were all destroyed, and there was even an old couch on the lawn. Their curtains had been torn down in tatters, with some windows showing some makeshift covers with towels and old sheets. The driveway was filled with foreign cars, some with detailing that didn't look like they fit their neighborhood at all. Everything inside of them screamed that there was danger ahead. They were in utter disbelief. What were they walking into? They parked their car across the street and cautiously made their way up the path to their front door. With each step, their hearts beat faster and faster. They anticipated trouble. They got to the front door and braced themselves. What happened next just confirmed what they had suspected. Miles tried to jam his key into the lock of the front door and immediately found that it no longer fit. The locks had been changed. Miles and Tracy exchanged worried glances, their hands instinctively reaching for each other. Knocking on their own door felt surreal, but they had no choice. After a tense moment, the door swung open to reveal a man they knew very well. Hassam Bakhtar, the seller of the house, leaned against the doorframe with an air of defiance. What are you still doing in our house? Miles demanded, his voice trembling with a mix of confusion and anger. Bakhtar smirked, crossing his arms. It's my house until I decide it's not, and right now, this is still my house. But you sold it to us, Tracy protested. And I will give it to you when I want to leave, the man replied. Miles' fists clenched at his sides. This is our house. We have a contract. Get out, now. Bokter's smirk widened. I'm not going anywhere. I have just as much right to be here as you do. The tension was palpable. Tracy, sensing the situation could escalate quickly, placed a calming hand on Miles' arm. She could see that this man was looking for a fight, which was the last thing they needed as new homeowners in a neighborhood where they didn't know anyone. Let's call the police, she said softly. It would be better to deal with things by the law. That way, they couldn't be accused of anything malicious. Miles dialed 911, his eyes never leaving Bokter's mocking gaze. As they waited, they could distinctly hear noises coming from inside the house, which told them Bokter was not even alone in their home. When the police arrived, their presence brought a sliver of hope. Surely there was no way those squatters could be residing in their home legally. It was a clear-cut case, or so they thought. The officers questioned Bokter, who produced a piece of paper claiming he was allowed to live in their house until the end of the year. Miles and Tracy watched in disbelief as the officers examined the document. They protested that they had never issued such a document and quickly explained what the situation truly was. The house belonged to them since they had bought it from Bokter weeks earlier. Surely they could do something. I'm sorry, one of the officers said sympathetically. This appears to be a civil matter. We can't remove them without a court order. The ground seemed to shift beneath Miles and Tracy. They had done everything by the books, yet they couldn't reclaim their own home. The officer suggested they consult a lawyer and left, leaving the couple standing on their front lawn, feeling helpless and betrayed. Bokter simply told them to do whatever they needed to do, but that they weren't going anywhere. The evil squatter then waved maliciously at the couple while slowly closing the door in their faces. Desperate and determined, Miles and Tracy contacted Lisa Pettis, a family friend who lived next door and had facilitated the sale. Did she know that the previous owner of their house was going to be squatting on their property? Lisa was horrified to learn about Bokter and his friends, and vehemently denied any agreement with them. She explained that she had gone on holiday for the last three weeks, just like she had cleared with them months prior. The squatters must have taken advantage of her absence to infiltrate the house while no one looked. With Lisa's support, the couple sought legal advice, but the process was slow and grueling. They couldn't believe that something so ridiculous was calling for so much verification and legal tape. 
Lisa testified that Miles and Tracy had bought the house from Bokter. While the courts were happy to confirm this, they noted one thing that really shocked the poor Alberts. As it turned out, the laws of California really leaned in favor of their evil squatters. And it seemed Bokter and his colleagues knew it all too well. The process of evicting anyone from a property one owns was lengthy enough. Cali laws dictated that notice had to be served first, and then the squatters had quite a long time to respond and get off the property. The problem was that, thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic that they were currently experiencing, the shutdown of several offices prevented them from obtaining the necessary notices served to the squatters. So until that time could happen, Bokter and his associates were legally allowed to stay in the Alberts' house. This made Tracy and Miles feel sick to their stomachs. How could such an absurd bit of bureaucracy stop them from living in their dream home that they had already paid for? They found themselves at an absolute loss. How were they meant to believe that they owned a house but had no right to occupy it, nor evict the people in it? This was truly unfair. What made Miles even more irate was the fact that this was just a California law. If they had bought a house in another state like Texas or South Carolina, they would never have to face such an injustice since those states favor homeowners over random civilians occupying their property. Feeling betrayed and frustrated, Miles decided to take their story public. He was adamant that if there was enough pressure, someone would help them. To make matters worse, he was sure that there were other people in the state experiencing the same thing. He called into a local radio station, sharing their plight with the community. The response was overwhelming. The story went viral, and soon television and radio stations from across the state were contacting the couple. They even had some stations from outside the state contact them to share their story with the whole nation. The idea of paying for something and it being stolen in return did not bode well with the average American, that was for sure. As the media coverage intensified, so did the squatter's defiance. Bokter and his accomplice, Fatima Cardoso, were not just squatters, they were convicts with a history of intimidation. Just as Miles and Tracy had suspected, they began threatening anyone who supported the Alberts, making it clear that they wouldn't leave quietly. It seemed that they were very aware of what they were doing and how they were taking great advantage of the current pandemic. Tracy often found herself questioning how someone could be so evil. But the worst was yet to come. One evening, a brick crashed through the window of her friend Lisa's house with a threatening note attached. Stay out of this or else. Lisa was beside herself with fear. It was horrific to receive threats in her own home and she hoped that the case would come to close soon. Fear gripped the community even further, but it also sparked a deeper resolve in Miles. He knew he had to protect his loved ones and claim their right to their dream home. That's when he remembered that he had a community he had yet to call upon. One that he knew would help put an end to any power the squatters thought they had. Miles was a proud member of the Iron Brotherhood, a biker gang consisting mostly of veterans who had each other's backs through thick and thin. They were well revered for their high sense of morale and ethics, but also their intimidating appearance. They were the type that people would ironically avoid. When they heard about Miles and Tracy's predicament, the bikers didn't hesitate to offer their support. Miles felt bad about calling in their help, as he had hoped that he could sort this nightmare out himself. But once the squatters started being violent with his friends and neighbors, he knew it was time to step it up a little. Jack Maverick Wilson, the gang's leader, was a towering figure with a heart of gold beneath his gruff exterior. Alongside him was Marcy Phoenix Thompson, a fiery redhead and former army medic. They met with the Alberts personally and promised that they would take care of them and their home. They would not have a sound night's sleep until their brethren were back in their home where they were meant to be. The very next day, the Iron Brotherhood convened at their clubhouse to plan their next move. They were determined to do whatever they needed to fix the issue. We need to show these squatters that they can't mess with one of our own, Maverick declared, his voice resonating with authority. Phoenix nodded in agreement. But we do it by the book. We don't want to give them any legal ammunition against us. They seem well aware of their rights. We just have to apply pressure in the right way. The plan was set. They would organize a peaceful demonstration showing strength in numbers and solidarity with the Alberts. They also enlisted the help of their network of attorneys to expedite the legal process. If there was any lawyer that was going to be motivated enough to help, it would be a veteran lawyer. Miles and Tracy were cautious to share their hope and relief with the community. 
They hoped that their plan was going to work, as they were truly at their wit's end. The day of the demonstration arrived. Dozens of bikers, clad in leather jackets emblazoned with the Iron Brotherhood's emblem, roared into the Alberts' neighborhood. The sight of the bikers, coupled with the media presence, drew significant attention. Miles and Tracy stood at the forefront, flanked by Maverick and Phoenix. The bikers formed a formidable line in front of the house, a silent yet powerful statement of unity and support. Then they began to unpack their bags that contained their tents. They had every intention of camping out in front of the house as long as it was needed. They were in no way going to show any weakness. What Bokter was doing with his accomplice was wrong, and they were going to make it very clear that they would not accept such behavior. Bokter and Cardoza watched from inside, their bravado faltering. They hadn't anticipated such a strong and organized response. The sight of the bikers, coupled with the media presence, made it clear that the community wouldn't back down. Maverick called out to the squatters in the house. You're not wanted here. What you are doing is theft. You will be evicted sooner or later, so do the right thing. Vacate now, and we'll leave you alone. Resist, and we will follow you around every day until the eviction notice is served. As tensions reached a boiling point, Bokter and Cardoso began to panic. The police, who had been coordinating with the bikers to ensure a peaceful demonstration, arrived in full force. This seemed to do the trick. Bokter and Cardoso clearly began to feel the pressure. It was at this moment that they realized that they were outnumbered and outmaneuvered. What happened next was shocking. Bokter and Cardoso made a desperate attempt to flee. Their actions proved that there was nothing innocent about what they were doing. The bikers, led by Maverick, quickly blocked their escape routes. The police moved in, arresting Bokter and Cardoso for trespassing, vandalism, and making criminal threats. Enough charges had been laid by other members of the community for them to at least arrest the men. This was all Miles and Tracy needed. Once they were out of their house, they were sure as hell they would never get back in. The crowd erupted in cheers, the sense of justice and relief palpable. It was a success for everyone involved. Not only did the Alberts finally get the chance to move into their new house, but the community got their safety back. They were no longer sharing their dream neighborhood with horrific gang members. There was a lot to celebrate. With the squatters finally removed, Miles and Tracy stepped into their home. What they saw made them sick to their stomach. The interior was trashed with broken furniture and graffiti-covered walls. There was a horrific smell of urine and feces around the house. Splayed around were discarded needles, pills, and alcohol bottles. It was clear that the house had hosted more than one distasteful gathering. Bokter made it very clear that he had no intent on passing the house on in the right condition. This alone was cause for charges, something that the Alberts were going to be very sure to follow up on. They had invested $560,000 in this house, but at the sight of what they were looking at, they weren't sure it was worth even half of that now. Tracy broke down in tears. The sight of their once beautiful home in such disarray was heart-wrenching. What were they going to do? Their insurance was not going to cover this at all. How would they pay for the repairs? Where would they even start? It all started feeling very overwhelming for the couple, who began questioning whether such a mess was even worth to try and fix. But the Iron Brotherhood didn't stop at removing the squatters. They rolled up their sleeves and got to work. They made it clear that they were by their sides from the start to the end. With military precision, they began cleaning, repairing, and restoring the house. Volunteers from the community joined in, their support unwavering. It was such a heartwarming experience for the couple. They had never expected such amazing support from everyone. As the days passed, the house began to regain its former glory. The lawn was trimmed, the walls were repainted, and new furniture replaced what had been destroyed. Tracy made a point of discarding anything that had ever been touched by the evil squatters. The idea of living alongside things that had been vandalized in such a way felt like a violation for them. They could clean and redo the walls and floors of the house to make it new again, but everything else had to be replaced. They still couldn't get over how quickly the squatters had been able to trash the home that was once so beautiful. But they were glad to know that the volunteers were fixing it just as quickly. The outpouring of support from the community was overwhelming, and Miles and Tracy felt a renewed sense of hope and gratitude. The help even extended past just assisting them physically and went as far as helping them gain financial assistance. A GoFundMe page set up by Phoenix raised enough money to cover all the repairs and then some. 
The stress of being able to buy and repair what they needed was taken away immediately. It was a massive relief. As a show of gratitude, the couple used the excess funds to set up a support fund for other Californians who were facing the same issues thanks to the pandemic. Then they even went a step further and served a letter to their local counselor to adjust the laws to match those in other states. They felt very strongly that they shouldn't have had to face the entire ordeal to begin with. The Iron Brotherhood's intervention showcased the unbreakable bonds of brotherhood and the power of standing together against injustice. The couple would be eternally grateful for them. As Miles and Tracy settled into their home, they knew that they had been given a precious gift, not just the restoration of their house, but the reminder that they were never truly alone. They had a community that stood by them, ready to fight for what was right. What an incredible story of community and determination. How would you have felt if you found strangers in your home like this? What do you think about how the situation played out? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and till next time.